Buonasera a tutti dell'American Academy in Rome e buonasera a Roma. Siamo felici di darvi il benvenuto a un altro evento del tema del nostro anno, la città. Good evening to all of you. We are very happy to have you here. My name is Avinoam Shalem and I am the director of the American Academy in Rome. I'm very happy to open this evening here with you all today, even if I don't see you now, uh, for another event of our yearly or annual team theme of the city. And I'm very happy to have here Pamela Long, Nicola Kamerlenghi, and my dear colleague, the Mellon professor at the American Academy, Lynn Lancaster. It's all yours, Lynn, in your hands. Thank you. Thank you, you Avinoam. So welcome to everyone to our conversation today and it's entitled The City of Rome, Urban Infrastructure and Urban Form from Medieval to Early Modern Times. And I'm really delighted to bring together our two guests today, Nick Camerlinghi and Pamela Long, both of whose work I very much admire. Nick Camerlinghi is Associate Professor in the Department of the History of Art at Dartmouth College. He received architectural history degrees from Yale University, MIT, and Princeton University. And Nick specializes in the study of early Christian and medieval architecture with a particular interest in the city of Rome. He's currently the Digital Humanities Fellow at Harvard's Villa Itati in Florence, though he's not actually in Florence, partly due, well, wholly due to COVID, um, as he will probably explain. He's also been the recipient of grants or fellowships from the Swiss Institute in Rome, the Biblioteca Hertziana via the Crest Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Nick recently published his first book, St. Paul's Outside the Walls, a Roman Basilica from Antiquity to the Modern Era with Cambridge Uni University Press in 2018. The book also has a digital website component and thanks to a, a recent digital publications grant from the NEH, he will be able uh, to publish uh, his interactive virtual reality models of St. Paul's complex history as an open educational resource for uh, anyone who's interested. Nick is also a lead researcher of the Mapping Rome Collaborative based at University of Oregon, Stanford University, and Dartmouth College. Today we will hear about his efforts to study late medieval and early Renaissance Rome uh, and the networks of surveillance and power by mapping, among other things, the city's towers and bell towers. Pamela Long is an independent scholar par excellence. She's the author of Openness, Secrecy, Authorship, Technical Arts and Culture of Knowledge from Antiquity to the Renaissance, published by Johns Hopkins in 2001. And that won the Morris D. Forkosh Prize for the best book in, um, in intellectual history uh, from 2001, which is awarded by the Journal of the History of Ideas. Most recently, and most relevant to our discussion today, she's published Engineering the Eternal City, Infrastructure, Topography, and the Culture of Knowledge in Late 16th Century Rome with University of Chicago Press, and that came out in 2018. And that has already won numerous prizes, including the Sidney M. Edelstein Prize from the Society of uh, the History of Technology, the Bridge Book Award from the Casa della Letteratura in Rome, which she was actually here at the American Academy to accept. The Howard R. Moraro Prize from the American Catholic Historical Association and the Spiro Kostov Book Award from the Society of Architectural Historians. Now, as an independent scholar, Pam has relied on fellowships and she has an impressive track record. She was a fellow here at the American Academy in 2003, 2004, and she's gone on to receive fellowships from the Getty Research Institute, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Science Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the National Humanities Center in North Carolina, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, and the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, where she is now, 
And then I should not forget to mention that she is also a MacArthur Fellow. So before turning this over to them, I just want to say a few words about the idea of bringing these two scholars together to talk about the urban development of Rome. They're both looking at urban development, but each is looking at a different point in the history of Rome. Nick at medieval and Pam at early modern. They're also using very different methodologies, as we'll see. Now, when we all three began brainstorming about this uh, infrastructure of Rome event, we came up with the idea of structuring it around the process of studying process. Nick is developing his project out of a team-based effort to map Rome, whereas Pam's approach is based on archival work and is a more solitary endeavor. Both approaches yield important yet different insights into the city and both are to some degree governed by different career trajectories. In addition, we're currently in a difficult moment during this period of COVID. Uh, Nick was supposed to be in Florence at Itati, but instead finds himself using the fellowship at home to develop new ways of working with his material. Whereas Pam had hoped to be back at the archives in Rome this summer, uh, but with the current uh, restricted access, um, that's probably not going to happen. So in a sense, we have here today a series of contrasts in the process of studying process, yet they share similar goals of understanding what made the Eternal City into what it is today. So Nick, I am going to turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Lynn, for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to share some of my current work in this conversational setting. My particular area of interest is medieval Rome, a period and a place which presents complex challenges. The study of this period, loosely framed between the 4th and 14th centuries, has generally been accorded a secondary status with respect to antiquity or the Renaissance and Baroque. Over the centuries, many medieval buildings have fallen, been deliberately dismantled or replaced. Primary sources are scarcer for the medieval period than for later times, and in some cases less prevalent even than those from antiquity. We lack many of the sorts of documents that Pamela Long is gonna be discussing. Likewise, it was not uncommon for early archeologists to dig through and obliterate medieval layers in their search for ancient strata. Now, fortunately, attitudes are changing as evidenced most eloquently by the excavations in the Imperial Fora and at the Crypta Balbi. The latter has come to serve as an unofficial museum for medieval Rome. Like many of us, I'm currently rendered homebound by the pandemic. I do not live in Rome anymore, and yet there are ways that I can study what interests me remotely. In striving to devise such alternative approaches, I have found that the digital tools and techniques that I will share with you today prove a worthy complement to standard archival and archeological methods. The basic question, that I'm asking is how can one best visualize and analyze medieval Rome? I suggest that maps and the process of mapping are valuable entry points. Of course, we lack a medieval map of Rome. And the rigorous and scaled representations that make maps useful to us was a later innovation. And we lack a comprehensive modern map of medieval Rome. Let me show you a selection of some maps of uh, medieval Rome. At left, we have Richard Krauthammer, who shows uh, the river, the walls, some topography, some streets. And his most uh, keen interest in this map is to show churches loosely located where they were, but uh, on the basis of when they're first mentioned in the sources. And to do so, he uses keys and numbers um, to, to identify that detail. In the middle, we have Robert Coates Stevens, who is uh, plotting the archaeological evidence, the remains for early medieval housing in Rome. 
and he uses a modern map of the city, but uh, uses 36 little uh, you know, black dots with numbers uh, that relate to the location of this important evidence. And finally, Ravaglioli's map, uh, which is used by Kessler and Zacharias in the book Rome 1300, to illustrate a procession that takes place from the Lateran through the Colosseum, the Forum, and ultimately uh, arriving at Santa Maria Maggiore. This too is a modern map. You can get a glimpse of uh, Termini train station at the top right corner. The work of scholars like Kessler, Coates Stevens, and of course, uh, Richard Krautheimer is essential to our understanding of medieval Rome. These representations serve to get their author's points across, but their value sometimes ends there. Uh, there is only so much that an anachronistic modern map of a, or a map that reduces actual built footprints to numbers and dots can do to help us visualize and analyze the fabric of a city. Like chamber music, these maps isolate and highlight a limited number of features. I was inspired to imagine if a more orchestral holistic representation might be possible with digital maps. Incidentally, if you're a novice to this material, you might try your hand at digital mapping through Harvard's World Map website. It's full of tutorials. I started there. I should say that now I'm using a program called QGIS and another well-known program. In fact, the industry standard is ArcGIS or ArcGIS. I began thinking about my mapping process while teaching at the University of Oregon. There I collaborated with James Tice, Eric Steiner, and Alan Seen. Our team is behind MappingRome.com, which serves as a digital display case for our project. There's nothing commercial about this. It's just the, 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 the website name that we have. Uh, Nolli, uh, the, Tice, Steiner, and Seen are well known to scholars of Rome for their 2005 Nolli Map website. Giovanni Battista Nolli in 1748 published a monumental map of Rome, which quickly became the gold standard for maps of the city. The Nolli map website that uh, made that pioneering work interactive for students and scholars alike. A few years later, the same trio of researchers developed a related website on the views of Giuseppe Vasi. Sadly, just this past January, both websites became obsolete when Adobe Flash stopped being supported by web browsers. So it's no longer possible to interact with the map and the plethora of data compiled 15 years ago. Now, with the invaluable collaboration of Giovanni Zvevo, an Italian archaeologist, GIS expert, and website designer, and with support from a team of student researchers from the University of Oregon, Dartmouth, Stanford, and Brown, we georectified the Nolli map, which means we stretched it and distorted it to align more precisely to reality. We also enriched the historical data connected with each of Nolli's 1,320 numerically identified features. On screen, you see uh, the data, uh, historical data, the patronage data related to number 130. And we're about to launch the Nolli and Vasi website version 2.0 through Stanford University. We've included 3D components and educational narratives aimed uh, at experts and students alike. I can't stress enough just how collaborative this kind of work is. Now, back to my medieval map. I began that task uh, by transposing analog maps rich with medieval data to an empty digital map. As a base, I used the georectified Nolli map you see on screen and more recent surveys to anchor the placement of buildings more precisely. Then we plotted the detailed plans of about 250 medieval churches based on the positions and orientations first proposed by Christian Hulsen in 1927. These of course need updating and that's happened gradually with work by Krautheimer and also more recent studies by the Swiss-based Corpus Cosmatorum team of which I'm also a part. Many of these churches have bell towers which were added as little blue squares visible on screen. Several of the circa 300 known defensive towers that belong to the city's baronial families were also added in red squares. And if their location was unknown, their names were used and placed proximate to where they're believed to have been. 
to the extent possible. We plotted some of the fortifications and the defensive compounds that you see on screen. Uh, and this, I really need to say, is quite provisional again. We were honored to incorporate a treasure trove of data related to the waters of medieval Rome from an expert on the subject, Catherine Rinney. Note, for instance, four of the water mills near the Tiber Island toward the bottom of the screen. And yes, I also use handy dots once in a while on, uh, on my map. We uploaded and incorporated archaeological data from the map database called CITAR, S-I-T-A-R, uh, which is openly available and produced by the Sovrintendenza, which oversees the city's antiquities. When necessary, these have been supplemented with plans by Andrea Carandini uh, and his Atlante di Roma Antica or other recent publications. Our cartographic assets include Lanciani's Forma Urbis Rome of 1901, which though antiquated has proven a valuable cross-reference, and a modern day topography map of the city. Now, again, what you see on screen is kind of a composite of all this information, very much a work in progress. My task is to continue curating and adding data, ensuring its accuracy to the best of my abilities, and being sure to distinguish certainties from more hypothetical proposals, as in the example of the baronial towers. Digital maps demand precision, but they allow for ambiguity which makes them ideal for unraveling scholarly puzzles. I then looked to include forms of data that were not originally planimetric. I was particularly curious about the defensive towers and the bell towers of the late medieval city. So I turned to a number of impressive panoramas made by transalpine artists around the middle of the 16th century. Here's one attributed to Hermann Postumus, which is over a meter in length, drawn on multiple sheets of paper glued together from a vantage point somewhere on the Capitoline Hill. To mine it for data, I needed to determine the vantage point. So I realized that there were certain alignments in the drawing. That is to say that, for example, if you look at the left side of the screen, the left side of Santa Sabina's bell tower aligns vertically with the left side of San Tomobono's dome. Well, let's look in the middle of the screen, Torre dei Conti, which right beneath it in the center has the bell tower of Sant'Adriano. Now, these are two points in space that align in the eye of the draftsman. They create a line that goes to the eye of the draftsman. And I found, identified about seven, eight, I think actually 10 of these, and ultimately plotted them on the georectified correct map of uh, the city and found a centroid, a center, center somewhat of a center, which is, of course, where the lines go, and it's the eye of the draftsman. Again, we're close. We're about two car lengths. There you can see the photograph, uh, two car lengths or so in terms of that creating a viable space for the position of the draftsman. Keep in mind, these are 500-year-old pieces of paper. They've been glued together, and even the instruments of uh, the, the surveil surveying uh, were, were quite rudimentary. So this isn't bad. Now, with a centroid of sorts, that is to say a viewpoint, it's now possible to query that panorama and start to identify what some of the objects in uh, the drawing are. And not everything has been identified by scholars. And for example, if you look at the right side of the screen, you'll see this bell tower. And the bell tower is three stories tall, looks very much like a medieval bell tower, uh, typical for Rome. And it covers the fourth and a little bit of the fifth bay of the theater of Marcellus directly behind it. Now. If we're standing where we are, the right side of the map, and we're looking towards the theater of Marcellus on the left side of the map, there's our sight line. Somewhere along that sight line is the bell tower. And there, sure, sure enough, is a church, a medieval church in that location. And in fact, if you look at the drawing, it seems like you even see the gable roof that is in the foreground with respect to the bell tower. So we should presume the bell tower is behind the body of the church. This is why I'm postulating that this is the location, a plausible location for this particular bell tower. A bell tower that wasn't part of the corpus of bell towers of medieval Rome. And uh, when it was destroyed in 1929, that bell tower had long been gone. So these are a few of the photographs of the site. The church is called Santa Maria in Vincis. It does show up in a view from Tempesta, uh, which is the entirety of Rome from 1593. But there's a two-story bell tower. You can see Posthumus gives us instead data for a three-story 
bell tower. So it's exercises like this done uh, repeat repeatedly that can provide more uh, information about towers and bell towers in particular. Now, uh, Posthumus is good, but Vingard is a professional. I mean, literally a professional. He goes around to Spain and Italy representing views of uh, cities, and he's got the technique down. So these four views are really quite remarkable in the detail and in the accuracy. I've done the same operation, basically, taking again Nolli, and here is uh, Hermanus Posthumus's view from the Capitoline Hill. And here are the alignments that I found in um, Vingard's view from the Aventine. And they suggest that he was drawing from that particular point on the slope uh, downward. The same is true of lines that converge in one single point for the Quirinal. Here, uh, Vingard was standing on the ruins of the Baths of Constantine. This is a 350 degree view, and it would have been 360 had the sheet not been cut off at some later moment in time. And then not too far from the American Academy, uh, he sat down and did a view from the Juniculum. Now, all of these lines are lines that depart from the viewpoint and go and land and stop at the, at the object in question. So I've identified all of these towers, churches, bell towers, domes, uh, not all of them medieval, some of them are you know, closer to Vingard's time. What's interesting is when these lines intersect. For example, we have the view that Vingard gives from the Aventine, and we have a tower just to the right of the Pantheon, and in relationship to some other sites that are, that are not uh, in this little snippet that I gave you. But so I'm able to draw that line from his viewpoint. The same is true for the tower, the same tower, but now from Posthumus's angle, and he's giving us this view. This, that tower is positioned roughly between the Torre Argentina behind it to the right and the Palazzo della Cancelleria behind it to the left. And from the Quirinal, again, using alignments, I'm able to shoot that line of, of Vingard's view and postulate, again, with some degree of accuracy, that this is the location of this particular tower, a particular tower that no longer exists, uh, at least it's been greatly lopped off, the Torre del Melangolo. It's now part of Palazzo Patrizzi Clementi, not too far from Santa Maria in Campitelli. This is actually an important uh, site because this is where Ignatius of Loyola resided uh, when he was in Rome, according to tradition. So we're able then to uh, bring together information about from these maps and use them to plot uh, information that we're lacking about the location of towers. Vingard has a most attentive eye. He depicted so much so accurately that the structures are identifiable, especially when playing them off of an accurate map. I mean, everyone could probably identify the Pantheon here, but I challenge you to identify some of these other towers. And in some cases, again, these are views of buildings that no longer exist. I'm currently experimenting with the possibility of deriving the heights of these prominent structures. Um, that have since been demolished or locked off, like the Torre del Melangro, by calculating them against known elevations. You see, we know the height of the Pantheon in the image on the left. We know how much further it was from the tower and from the viewer. So some simple calculations should offer an estimate. Now, if we do that same operation multiple times for the same tower, but from different views, it's possible that we're kind of reducing any error and getting a viable number viable estimate for the heights of these towers. I don't know yet. I'll let you know if this works out. <laughs> I think there's a value to modeling the uh, spiky profile of late medieval Rome, even though a complete picture is impossible. A number of questions arise when mapping the polygonal footprints of medieval structures, rather than just identifying them as uh, dots or numbers. And similarly, new questions are prompted by extruding these plans vertically into three dimensions. For instance, we might ask about ballistics. Just where would the arrow slits or the catapult bay of the Torre delle Milizie permit one to fire? What percentage of towers was located on a hillside or a promontory? Were they shorter because they were already on a hilltop? Were they uh, and were they prevalently on the perimeter or in the center of these compounds? Again, here's a provisional visualization, but digital mapping could allow us to ask what towers could see each other, what we might call intervisibility among the towers. And this rather eye-catching visualization was generated by assuming that all the towers were 30 meters high and that they had a very bright light shining from their top. 
What you see then is a representation of the city where some areas are more light than others. That is, they are within sight of more baronial towers. Notice how well lit the geniculum is, suggesting that Vingard knew what he was doing. He chose a great spot in, uh, for his vantage point. Again, I need to underscore towers are not all 30 meters high. There were uh, built, uh, other built obstacles in the way, more than just topography, which is what this map considers. So this is not usable data. It's more of an amuse-bouche for things to come, hopefully. Obviously, 3D mapping is easier for extant bell towers. Um, I have been begun already to insert them as vertical extrusions on a 3D map of the city that I am developing. And likewise, for bell towers, we might ask uh, what importance, importance is ascribed to height? Was it a matter of visibility, of acoustics, defense, or merely status? I've always wondered why Santa Maria and Cosby had such a tall bell tower in comparison to its rather diminutive uh, church beneath. And we will never be able to recapture the vision of Master Gregorius, the Englishman who traveled to Rome in the early 13th century who described the city from Monte Mario as a forest, I'm quoting, as a forest of towers as dense as stalks in a field of grain. And yet, it's worth trying to model and map the city for the sake of visualization and analysis. As I hope to have shown, just the process of transposing information to this digital platform and the effort of translating these panoramic views is helping to generate a more precise composite map of late medieval and early uh, Renaissance Rome. And in those processes, interesting discoveries and observations are being produced. Thanks for your attention. Wow, thanks, Nick. That was, that was incredible. It's really exciting work. Um, so I, I just wanna say, uh, if anybody, if questions are coming into your head, uh, please do use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the page and uh, you can write uh, your questions in as they, they come up. Um, I'm not sure that we'll be able to get to everyone's question, but I will assure the audience that um, all of the questions will be sent to the speakers afterwards uh, if, we, um, if we don't get to your questions. So now we get to hear from Pamela. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Pam. Uh, far left. Uh, the far, far bottom left corner should be a little microphone. Okay, I think. No, I'm okay. Okay, okay you're good. Yeah, yeah, I know how to unmute, but it's just, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, now let me get my, um, all right, sorry, sorry, everyone. Thank you. I just wanted to thank um, Lynn and Evanilum and the American Academy, and also thank you very much, um, all of um, the people that are here taking the time to um, listen in and, and participate. It's a great honor to be here. And I wanted to start with this. This is my one of my very fa favorite uh, drawings of Rome. It's a drawing by, it, it was attributed to um, Etienne du Perrac, although I don't think that's the correct um, attribution. And it's drawn from the roof, or, or there must have been some kind of terrace on the top of the Cancelleria, which is near um, the Campo di Fiori, if you know Rome. And you can see all these towers that Nick was talking about. And here is the Pantheon. So Rome was a very different um, city than um, in the late 16th century than it is now. And, and it's a fascinating thing to try to envision what it was like at that time. So to, what I'm going to talk about is my research on my book, Engineering the Eternal City, published in 2018. Um, and I'm going to talk about the processes of my research as a way of getting at the processes of the city itself. That is, how, um, how the infrastructure of the city uh, came about. Um, 
Now, one, one aspect of uh, the uh, city of Rome that I think it's important to keep in mind um, is that in the medieval and uh, early modern times, <clears throat> excuse me, Rome was governed by two entities, not by one. It was governed by the Pope and the papal bureaucracy called the Camera Apostolica, um, but it was also governed by the traditional city council of Rome, the traditional city government. And that government is called the Capitoline Council, which was headed by three conservators, they're called, who were elected um, every three months. New ones were elected every three months. Now, in the 16th century, the Pope certainly had a lot more power than the Capitoline Council. But it's incorrect to think that the Capitoline Council had no power. In fact, the Capitoline Council was made up of Roman patriciate men, and uh, they, they had very much local power in their neighborhoods, and they also had some power vis-a-vis um, the Pope and the papacy. And the wonderful thing for historians is that um, the conflicts and communication between the two governments creates lots of documents. And so that's, that's great for us who like to study Rome. Um, <clears throat> now my book for the most part encompasses a 30 year period, not completely because there are some exceptions, but um, and uh, in this, I gradually, as I did the research on this book, I, I came to this 30 year period um, thinking that really less is more in the sense that if I just took 30 years, I could um, do research uh, much more in depth than if I had taken 200 years, for example. Um, my, uh, the book begins with the great Tiber River flood of 1557, um, which destroyed, basically destroyed the low-lying areas of Rome. And I, so I was doing research on, on this flood when a flood did happen when I was there. So I thought I, it was a dramatic uh, flood. I thought I'd show some images from the flood I was in. Um, it was a dramatic flood, but I have to say it was not uh, as serious as the flood of 1557. Uh, here, this is the island, if you know we're on the end of the island, which usually comes out to here. I don't know if you can see my pointer. And over here is a bridge called the, um, well, the Santa Maria della, um, um, the Ponte Santa Maria, but now it's called the Ponte Roto, the broken bridge. And it was broken several times in floods and then remained broken. Um, at the end. And this, so this is the beautiful Ponte Sisto in normal, in normal uh, times without a flood. And you see along the side here, there are high walls. And these walls were built in the 1880s um, to prevent the destruction of the center of the city whenever the Tiber River flooded. Um, and the Tiber River flooded, floods um, fairly often. And certainly in the 16th century, there were devastating floods. And I want you to notice the beautiful keyhole here um, so that you can understand what the flood was like um, when um, in 2008. And in the 1557 flood, we know how high it was. The, the water would have, I think, come over the bridge. Um, and this is a, a close up of the, of the broken bridge that I mentioned before that was. Um, destroyed by Tiber River floods. Here's a wonderful um, image by G Gerhard Terborg, the elder. Uh, um, it's around 1600 and it shows uh, people working on the bridge to repair it. Although I have to say it was never repaired actually in the end. That, that was a, an infrastructure project that never succeeded. <clears throat> and here is the broken bridge. Um, uh, during my, my, I call it my flood, during my flood in 2008. So um, my book uh, begins with this flood of 1557, and it ends with the death of Pope Sixtus V in 1590. And there, here he is with all the, uh, his various building projects and engineering projects um, around him. And he's really saying, these were my projects. I, I did these, although um, this was not quite the case. 
Um, <clears throat> the book is about floods and flood control. It's about bridges and grid repair. It's about street construction, street paving, and most important, street cleaning. Um, it's about the construction or reconstruction of two aqueducts, the Aqua Virginae and the Aqua Felice. And here's a little piece of the Aqua Felice, um, which is in a place called Aqueduct Park in the suburb, or it's at, um, sort of in the suburbs of Rome. And there are also chapters on maps and topography. This is the famous um, Buffalini map, which is a fascinating map, which um, Leonardo Buffalini uh, created in 1551 and was published in 1560 as well. And it's about moving and raising obelisks. And this is just one of the images, wonderful images um, of that activity. So when I started out and during the whole project really, I wanted to envision the city as a whole. I mean, I realize that's a kind of romantic notion maybe, but um, I wanted to know, well, what was the city like in this 30 year period? Not what it's like now, but what was it like then? What were the infrastructure problems? How were decisions made about these problems? Who were the people there? How were, the, how were problems solved? Or, and I was just as interested in how were they not solved? What were the failures? I was interested in the failures as well as the successes. How did you decide? And this was the main question in all my documents, I think, who would pay for this infrastructure? Um, and that was a very contested um, question. And also who should be in charge of the work? Also all contested things. So um, one approach I took to get at processes, so I wanted to get at processes, was to read 30 year runs of documents. And so for example, I read over the years, I read um, 30, a 30 year run or more than that, because I started in 1557 and ended in 1590, run of the minutes of the Capitoline Council. For example, I found out all kinds of things that I think I would not have found if I had just gone um, from reference to a particular place in a document, but rather just reading the, the documents all the way through. In another example, I read all the handwrite, handwritten newsletters that are called a VZ di Roma. They were written by uh, anonymously by secret, um, they were secret and sent out to the informants of the secret writer to all parts of Italy and beyond. And they're wonderful documents for gossip, um, all kinds of gossip, interesting gossip, but also they mention um, infrastructure projects and, and what people thought of, of these projects. Another kind of document that I studied were papal bulls, which are formal edicts given out by the popes. <clears throat> and these, I, I didn't read all papal bulls, of which there are thousands, but I read all papal bulls in a 200 year period that had to do with streets and with the masters of the streets. And I also studied edicts by the masters of the streets. Um, masters of the streets are, were officers that were in charge of things like dis property disputes between neighbors or cleaning the streets or paving. And they had a kind of evolving role in Rome during these centuries. Um, now, um, these documents, uh, so do these documents concern street cleaning, sewers, paving, dumping sewage into the river, a very important subject um, and other such matters. So they often describe the condition of the streets before they say, they say the streets are in horrible condition and they itemize what, in what ways. And then they say, so you must do this to uh, correct this um, horrible situation. Um, but, and they, and they're, since they're very repetitive over 200 years, so you know, they didn't actually so solve the problem. Um, and uh, you, it gives you an idea of what the streets of Rome were really like. And finally, um, as people, as historians who work in Rome all know, Rome has not one archive, but many. And as many historians who work on Rome, I work in many of them. For example, the Archivio di Stato, di Roma, uh, the Capitoline Archive and the Vatican Archive, and there are others. And, but what this, each of these archives has a different history and different collection of different kinds of documents. So in one archive, I would find mention of an infrastructure project 
say, fixing a bridge. And then in another archive, I'd find another document about that, but from a completely different point of view. And um, that, so that um, in this way, because of the many and diverse archives in Rome, I was able to uh, find many and diverse kinds of information um, about this, about particular subjects. So now in the short time remaining, I can ask, what did I learn from all these approaches? And of course I learned hundreds of things. I mean, I, but um, I just wanna mention uh, two or three. Um, first, the first one was, um, it was particularly striking to me, almost from the beginning to the end, that papal absolutism is a myth. And I think this is agreed upon now by other historians, but, um, in my research, the popes are constantly badgering the Catiline Council to make progress on certain infrastructure projects or to cough up money for these projects. Um, and the council always agreed. Uh, they were always very, yes, we are going to do this. They always agreed. Uh, they created committees. They discussed it from one month to the next, and they deferred. And often they did not deliver. The problem was first, lack of funds. Second, there was not a permanent bureaucracy to take care of infrastructure matters, nor was there any funds ready, readily available for any future projects. And finally, there was a complete lack of agreement on who should take the responsibility for any particular in infrastructure and including who should pay for it. Now to give, I'll just give one example. Um, from the early 1560s, the beautiful Ponte Sisto, my favorite bridge in Rome, um, which was built in the previous century, was apparently on the point of collapse in the 1560s, in the early 1560s. In, in the early 1560s, there are repeated messages from Pope Pius IV, who is here, to messages from him to the council. And then after he died in 1565, there are repeated messages from Pius V, the next Pope, that the council should see to the repair of the bridge. And finally, in 1566, I just read one communication that I found um, that I translated uh, from Italian into English. Quote, for many months, his holiness, just as his predecessor has ordered the conservators to organize the restoration of the bridge. Clearly, he said, the Pope said, the condition of the bridge, worsens, bridge worsens every day. If it were repaired today, one would spend little, but if it falls into the river, it will cost much more and be highly inconvenient to everyone, unquote. So this bridge was finally repaired, but only after years of cajoling and threats from the Popes to the council, which does not suggest the Pope could just issue an order and then have it carried out. Now, lastly, I'm going to just do two points. Lastly, I would say that Rome of the past is sometimes idealized by ordinary people and also by scholars who study Rome. However, reading descriptions of the deplorable state of the streets in papal bulls and edicts from the masters decade after decade, from the 1420s to the 1580s, one can, can note that they sound a very remarkably similar. So here is an example of a law issued in late, the late 15th century. And I again, I quote, but in my English translation, <clears throat> no one may throw debris from building construction, dirt, mortar, rubble, and clay into the street. When it rains, no one is allowed to throw waste into the street. Waste on the streets should be raped so it doesn't clog the drains. No one should throw fecal matter into the drains or garbage or stinking water or other fetid matter. Everyone who has paved in front of their houses must clean every Saturday and throw the sewage into the river. Those with unpaved streets, that means those with palaces that have not paved this, the street in front of their palaces, must throw waste into the river once a month. Drainage spouts from houses emitting waste into the streets are forbidden. Human waste cannot be put into small alleys where rain causes it to run into the streets, unquote. So regulations of this kind 
um, are repeated decade after decade. And they pr provide a portrait of the street, of the city streets that are far from the idealized vision that many have. And I think I'll end it there, but thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Well, that was certainly a micro macro contrast between the two of you. Um, so I know we've had a, you know, a couple of com conversations in uh, preparing this, but neither one of you knew exactly what the other one was going to say. So I guess I would uh, open it up. I have some questions of my own, but I would open it up. Uh, do either one of you have uh, a comment or a question uh, for each other? I have a comment for Pam, which is a, a thank you, because what you're suggesting about this absolutist uh, sense of the popes, of course, it's something that's also being uh, fought and uh, a tendency of going in that direction also for the Middle Ages. But the interesting situation is that usually the end story of some of these towers and baronial power and all of that is to say it all became you know, a moot point because it all became absorbed by the papacy. And so that's how we close and explain why these weren't built anymore, why towers became palaces and so on and so forth. Um, so it's interesting that you, you, in doing this, are stealing sort of the, the end point of, of something that has usually been a, a more revived narrative, or an older narrative of the Middle Ages. So I think it's nice that you're, you're telling us that the popes weren't all that powerful in essence, right? There's other forces to consider, and that's something that is also happening in the Middle Ages, in the, sorry, in the study of the Middle Ages. So. Well, and I think it's interesting to compare or to use like both of our approaches because they go to, they're totally different, but they go together very nicely, I think. Um, and I mean, I think the point about papal absolutism, um, one point is that if you only read documents that come out of the pap papacy, it's, they're going to seem completely powerful. You, you just have, but then if you, so you could just spend your life reading documents that come from the papacy and you think, well, a, law, a, a bull is, uh, or an edict is, is issued and then it's done. Well, it's issued, but is it done? That's, and so if you read in different archives, you find that, well, no, actually they're fighting about it over here and they're not doing a thing and they're not raising money and the, the money that is required from them and et cetera. So, um. So I have a question about Sixtus V, where you ended, because, you know, there's a very famous image um, in one of the lunettes in the, uh, in the Vatican Library that shows his road system and the obelisks. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he, he was very proud of, uh, of the road systems that um, he made. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering in your, uh, in your research, what sorts of things did you find about those particular roads where he's, you know, like carving these, uh, these roads through the middle of the, the city? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they actually don't go through the middle of the city. They sort of go. Well, yeah, up, yeah. You know, I mean, go, figure of speech. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, well, one thing I found uh, he, because, so he was interested in making straight streets named after him and having, and the obelisks were sort of focal points so that you, if you stand at Santa, um, uh, if you stand at um, Santa Maria Maggiore on Monte and look down, you can see the obelisk at, in front of the Spanish steps that wasn't there at that time, but that was the idea. And then you can look down and see the other obelisk at um, in front of um, San Giovanni Lateran. So the obelisks were focal points. The streets were named after him. The system wasn't um, completed at his death. Um, actually, the most interesting thing I found um, that I didn't get into the book my book was that uh, the the street that street was made by galley slaves. They he imported three thousand galley slaves who are people that have been imprisoned or, or who have been punished by um, 
by being sent to row galleys. And it's a very brutal punishment and most of them didn't survive, but there were these uh, 3000, which I found in an in Avisi di Roma um, that it says, and this street is made by these galley sites. So oh, that was very interesting. Yeah. Um, so for Nick, uh, I'm just sort of looking at some of the questions and there, there are a few people who have um, uh, sort of latched on to this acoustic idea. Uh, and I'm not sure if you've gotten to that point because I think you're in the, the more the data collection um, uh, point in your project, but how, how, once you get the data, how would you intend to pursue this idea of uh, acoustic Rome with the bell towers? Well, uh, it's a big, uh, exciting question. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna make sure all my ducks are in a row first, put all my bell towers on the map, and then uh, read up on everything that's been written because a lot has been done on acoustics now. It's really a wonderful time to do that. Mm -hmm. The challenges I foresee are, or here's the advantages. We even actually have some bell towers still remaining. We know what note that these bells are, are pitched at, which is a remarkable bit of, of evidence. The problem is that to conduct a, an acoustic study, you need the volume around it. And now what I showed you was a lot of towers. And I think that there's a, a sense that we can reconstruct those spiky towers. But what about 95% of the rest of the built fabric, which is lower houses, which are gonna play a role in acoustics, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that, uh, how do we model that? And I, I, you know, we'll, we'll see what technology comes up with. The second challenge is that usually we think of these as related to parishes. And one of the questions uh, brought that up, um, uh, to parish churches. The, the challenge here is to map parish churches, which is essentially something that cannot be done. We know where they were and they change and come and go or they get their status over time, but it's very, very difficult to get a sense at a particular moment in time where a parish began and another one ended. So, um, so I don't, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, and, and a few of these are monastic uh, bell towers. And so they are related to, um, the monastic community there, and they have a kind of inward uh, looking function to you know, call uh, people to, um, to, to their hours to, mm -hmm. to perform their, their monastic duties. So uh, it's still an open question for me about what we can do from that point of view, but the, the pieces are in place um, and, and then we'll see. Uh, you know, again, there's a lot of exciting work there uh, from Florence, from Constantinople, uh, you know, from Byzantium. So it's an exciting time to pursue this, I think. So the one, this is another process thing, but that uh, image that you showed of um, the light uh, where the geniculum was really bright, is that something that you can do within QGIS or do you have like special software that allows you to do that? So that is the work of um, my collaborator, one of my collaborators, Giovanni Svevo, mm -hmm. who works in QGIS. Yeah, so that's all done in QGIS um, okay. because once you have a landscape, uh, you mm -hmm. can you know project the light and you see that now what you can't yet do in QGIS but you can do in the other software ArcGIS is actually get a three-dimensional move around make that map not just be planning uh you know uh from the from the top mm -hmm. down but you can look at it in angles and so the, eventually I'll be moving towards that other software um mm -hmm. to, to do that um yeah that I think will be exciting once we know the heights of these towers and of course it's the heights at particular moments in times because they get locked off too and yeah. they suffer the ravages sometimes of popes and uh, sometimes of the commune and, and, and so on so so since I, I know that many of our viewers uh know quite well the american academy uh when you were showing uh all the converging lines it was very close to the academy uh, i just want to point out that from my reading of that map those uh those lines converged just between the Villa Aurelia and the Fontanone. So sort of the edge of the Villa Aurelia property. Exactly, um, where, the, uh, where the walls ran. I think he's on top of the walls. Yeah, yeah. Cause I was expecting it to be maybe over closer to the current day Garibaldi, but I, I was quite interested to see that uh, mm -hmm. Villa, Villa Aurelia is called Villa Aurelia because it's Built yeah. right, right on the walls. So we should go. Uh, we should go there now and and see if we can get a Absolutely. modern day. Absolutely. We're having a party right after this. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, I'll be there. 
Um, so I, we're running out of time, but uh, I have a question here uh, for Pam that, that gets back a little bit more to sort of the politics of infrastructure. And this question says, did the appointment of the new clerical offices, uh, officials, the president of the streets, have any impact on the process of fixing Rome's infrastructure? Um, that's a really interesting question. And the answer is basically, I don't know, um, because um, it, the, the president, so there was, a, there was an office of, the the um, the magistrate of the streets and then there was the president of the streets was a cardinal usually mm -hmm. um, and then there were two masters of the streets who were um, Roman patrician citizens they had to be because they had to know their the neighbors and everything um, because that gave them authority to say okay mm -hmm. Giovanni you can't put your wall out to here because you know this is um, but uh, the, the role of the Masters of the Streets is fascinating and it was very much evolving and it's not known at every point exactly what they could or could not do. I mean, the office of president who was a cardinal who, who really um, uh, usually didn't know anything about the street, although not always, um, were, was varied with whoever was in the, in, in the office. And, and what the Masters did, I mean, that's, one of the um, subjects of these papal bulls are what the masters of the streets should do. And it's very much an evolving thing. And it, it varies from not only um, as the years go on, but from under different popes and under different masters and under different mm -hmm. presidents. Yeah. So that's a very complicated yeah. non answer to that. Very good. That's a very good question. Yeah. Um, so just to, to sum up, I wanted to make a couple of observations. Uh, I, um, Nick is obviously dealing heavily with, with maps uh, in a digital way. I would also point out that part of Pam's work that she did not talk about is looking at um, the analog version of maps, the ancient maps, and talking about how just the whole process of map making sort of affected um, the, the way the city infrastructure was, was developing. Um, and conversely, uh, I guess it's a little bit more of a question for Nick, but I wonder in, in your work, when you're, you know, you're locating these towers, um, do you actually need to do archive work uh, to do your map work? Uh, to do the map work, no, uh, but uh, behind each one of these squares is a database with mm -hmm. extensive information, as extensive as I can make it, mm -hmm. when the tower was first documented, uh, when it was demolished, uh, where, who, public, who talks about a bibliography for the tower, uh, who owned the tower, because that's actually one of the few things we have records for, notarial acts. Mm -hmm. And you know says this this tower became from property from so and so went to so and so and then that person and that person and that's kind of nice you can trace that out, so I think it's very important to understand uh, to get the archival evidence. Um, I don't know if I see myself going to dig for it. I think at yeah. this point uh, I can rely on what's been published, and the truth is everything I'm doing will be published and made out put out there digitally, so that if someone's interested take it away and, and go down that particular path. But I do need to know who owned a certain tower at a certain time if we're talking about intervisibility. What if they own both towers? You know, that's an important thing. <laughs> yeah, well, that, yeah, that's, that's sort of where I, where I was going with right. that. So it's a lot of archival work and it's nice that they do come together in, in some cases. Yeah. Uh, so last point, it, once this, uh, your website goes live, where do we look for it? Ah, so <laughs> I had hesitations about, well, so it, technically it's there at Stanford, but um, I don't know if uh, I have permission to, so it, it's already there, it's just not yet the final version, so I, I'd say let's hold off if possible, and I'll, I'll, it'll be a publicity announcement, and okay. I'll do my best, but if, okay. you know, um, if you look Noli Stanford, you might find something already, I'm not sure if you Google that. Well, maybe you could tweet it or something. There you go, I'll get, I'll get an account for Twitter. Okay. <laughs> so, Sorry, I hesitated, but I, I think it's just best to wait until it's all done. It's the, nice. the, the technology of knowledge, Pam. Tweet. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, well, I just want to thank you both so much for doing this. This has been absolutely fascinating and you both do amazing work in your, your different ways. Um, so thank you. thanks again for, uh, for sharing with us. Thank you. Welcome, thank, thank you, thank you, Pamela, and thank you, Nicola. And noi diciamo adesso buon appetito. And see you soon on Zoom. Thank you. Yes, and for those who are still there, um, there, there are like 36 questions uh, listed here. And so uh, I will be sending those out to the speakers. So they, your efforts are, will not be wasted. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.